Hi, I'm Riga. This is you alright, and let's talk about this whole Wonderland thing. Before all that though, be sure to like the video if you like it, share it if you think others would like it, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and subscribe if you want to see more. Oh, and spoilers for chapter 13, there's your warning. Now, this whole Wonderland thing seems pretty obvious at this point. The girl who fell through the world, Alice falling down the rabbit hole, etc. There's a lot of references and nods. Oh, and one of my favourites I just realised by the way, before all this portal stuff, Ambrosius did examine Penny through a looking glass. That's really cheeky and I dig it. But weirdly, one thing I've seen a lot of is this question of what happens if you drop the staff into the void? I see this popping up like all over the place, which I'm not sure what people are expecting if that happens. It falls. It goes poof through the bottom out of the bubble like Yang. It falls through and goes to Wonderland with everyone else. That seems pretty obvious to me. But what I think is really interesting is this is a question I see popping up a lot and I didn't see like a prompt for it. I'm not sure why everyone thought of it. But I'm here to say that thinking over it, not only do I think that's what would happen if you dropped it, I'm pretty sure they're gonna drop it. Or throw it. They go. It's gonna go. It's gonna go through the bubble, is what I'm saying. Like, it's more than a thought experiment, it's gonna happen in the show. And the answer to why that is is also pretty obvious, because they need a way out. Ambrosius can make portals to these pocket dimensions, he can make these pocket dimensions, he can also make portals to real world places. If you need to get out, he's your guy. Because if you fall into this dreamland, this magic place, down this rabbit hole, how else do you get out? Depending on what version of the story you're looking at, Alice gets home in a variety of ways. But classically in the books, she just wakes up. One time she just wakes up, and then another time she grows really big and then just wakes up. Bam. That's it. It's meant to end the same way a dream can end. Just things are happening and suddenly snap, you're awake, different place, it's over. But if we look at our story, it makes a lot more sense to do it this way with the staff, because I don't think they're just going to wake up from a place they physically go to. Instead, you drop the staff, it falls into Wonderland. Now, once it falls into Wonderland, someone could take it, or it could just land somewhere that's nowhere near the others. We're falling into another realm, I don't think time and space have to add up, you know. All of you can fall through the same place and end up in different places, or some of you together and some of you across the world, it doesn't really matter, it's magic and weirdness. And it's meant to be replicating a dream. But whichever way it happens, it makes a lot of sense to me and just as a story, and for the magic and everything else that we know, that the staff falls into the void and the others that fall go on a quest to get it back. That's their goal in Wonderland because it's the only way to get out. From the comments and ideas I've seen, it seems people think something really weird will happen if they did drop it because the staff is perhaps leaving Remnant, but that implies the staff has anything to do with being on Remnant. It doesn't. It's made for Remnant, it's made for the people, but it's made by the gods and they can cross realms and worlds and do whatever they like. As it stands right now, it is in an alternate dimension and it's doing just fine. I don't think the safety of the staff is our concern if you were to drop it. I don't think it's going to break or stop working because it's not on Remnant or in the real world because it's there all the time. It spent the last however many years existing in a vault which is the same kind of dimension that they based this whole central location off of. And its creation or power, however you want to frame it, that was holding Atlas up, that was doing that task, worked just fine from inside the vault all the way to Atlas. So it doesn't seem to matter. Despite being housed in Atlas, it's in another realm, it's in a pocket dimension, yet the results of its powers worked perfectly fine in the world of Remnant. So it sh shouldn't make a difference. But also, since we're talking about Alice in Wonderland, there is a lot of us versus them mentality in that story, you know, like the outcast sort of people versus establishment, you know, like the Queen of Hearts and being an overlord, etc. I think there's a decent chance that the bad guy of this arc finds the staff. And if so, it could actually be a really fun idea of figuring out how to fight someone who has the staff, combat someone wielding it. Because I myself have criticized just how overpowered that staff is, how broken it really is. So if they have to fight someone who has it, then maybe we could learn, and it could be a fun way to learn, the ins and outs of all of its usage, as well as putting our heroes on the back foot against powerful forces in a travel arc. So that sets up how we may have to face forces like Salem in the future when they get relics that are this powerful. And just is as powerful as she is anyway. It's practice for fighting crazy powerful things. The actual big fear right now, more than dropping the staff, is anyone using the staff for anything. Because if they do that, the whole dimension that thousands of people are in, and all the portals, they disappear. That is a huge issue, especially for anyone inside, as they either get the equivalent of falling, or just die because the place ceases to exist. I have no idea. The literal plane of existence they're on will just vanish. 
So that's terrible. And also, if we're going to do a travel arc through Wonderland, I don't think we want thousands of refugees coming with us. The animators also definitely don't want thousands of people coming with us. But luckily, I don't think that's going to happen. Atlas and Mantle evacuating was already a sign of them dodging mass death. And despite Sinner's attack, which is terrible, 10 or 20 dead isn't thousands. Yeah, that's heartless to say, but we're talking background, you know, characters in a show that is driven by named heroes, so this is way less than it could be while still appearing heartless and cold. These people are dead though, and the staff will fall, but it probably won't be used again until everyone who is crossing has crossed. Even if it's taken, it may not be used immediately, when we have to actively use it to undo the last thing it did, it can still be keeping those portals up even after it's dropped, just like it can keep Mantle afloat even when in a vault. But even if it is used, or this place ceases to be, it's not as big an issue as you'd think, as long as all the refugees are out, which I'm sure they will be. Remember, they created this whole pocket dimension from nothing, based on an idea like the vaults. It either didn't exist totally before, or if it did and they sort of just filled it in, it exists on the same plane as the vaults. There's no reason they couldn't make another one, a new central location leading back out from Wonderland again. It's not as crazy as perhaps it appears from the outside. Also. If it were taken by someone, it's a scepter, it's a staff. If the Queen of Hearts of that land, so to speak, takes it, then it fits right in with the royal design and presentation to have this magical gilded staff in hand, so thematically we're on point. As for Wonderland, since it's early in the cycle, I want to spout off just some other general ideas that may happen. This is, you know, moving on from the staff is a central point of this video now. First on my mind is, are we going to meet a new cast of characters down there? Or are we going to have references from the characters above that go down there that lead us down interesting paths? Because the very first thing that came to mind was Neo. If Neo falls, this could be really interesting. Why? Because she's literally a pun interpretation of the Mad Hatter. She isn't insane, and the Mad Hatter is referenced to mental illness, due to lead, and a whole bunch of other stuff to do with hats, and you know what, long story. But instead, she is mad, she's angry, literally mad, and she's now a hatter. Okay, no, she doesn't make hats, she's not literally a hatter, but she is the only one in the story with a prominent hat that has like a backstory to it, a hat that you notice. And it's a bowler hat, which is like a cousin to the top hat, so just, you know, it could be fun. Plus, it's gender flipping that idea, which, you know, as we've seen with, like, Team Juniper and everything, has been something that is fun to do with inspirations. And no, she's not inspired by the Mad Hatter. I just mean that, like, as a reference to the Mad Hatter, oh, it's a gender flip. It's just a fun note. Also, as against the idea of mad as it may sound, she's also pretty reasonable. I mean, yeah, she still wants to murder some kids, but she has reason to want to murder those kids. Just like with Cinder, who faced with an impossible outcome, she will make a smart decision that benefits her. Meaning if they're trapped in an alternate reality, they may be forced to work together. And that could be really fun, admit it. It'd be pretty awesome to have Yang and Blake and Ruby have to equally swallow their anger and pride to work with Neo. Over the course of their adventure, they can both learn things. They can learn both sides of the argument, realize things about each other, what really happened with Torchwick for Neo. Ruby, Blake, and Yang can learn that perhaps Neo's motivations weren't as, you know, unfounded as they seem. Because, you know, oh, she wants revenge for Torchwick, but Torchwick was a bad guy. But then you can do the backstory or something, and no, you learn he wasn't. And there's a bunch of ways you can do that, especially in Wonderland. You can learn more about Neo's motivations and why she feels how she does. A real window into why she's doing what she's doing, taking things deeper. And if there's any way to show it, it'd be in Wonderland. There's a bunch of ideas you can adapt with it. It's a magic land. If Neo could take the others on a trip through her memories, perhaps. With the last question used on Jin, we thought something like that might be impossible now. You know, it takes away that key, but if you're going to find another way around it, it'd be here. Maybe she meets the hookah-smoking caterpillar and it uses its smoke like Jin's magic. Who knows? I'm not sure, but don't rule out the possibility of this getting weird and wonderful. And you could do little stories like, you know, that the recontextualization, perhaps, of what Torchwick was doing, and perhaps why he was doing it that he alluded to, will make Ruby and the others have, you know, changed ideas about some of their villains and why they might be doing things, and that helps for things like Mercury, perhaps, or, you know, wherever we head in the future. Interestingly, and I don't think this will happen, but it could be weird, is if other characters we already know fill in the other roles from the Tea Party. So, Neo is the Mad Hatter, what about the March Hare? Okay, I know that at this point absolutely no one is asking to spend more volumes with her, and Crow might just murder her anyway, or she explodes with a bomb, but as far as literal characters named Hare, we do have one. 
you know, you fill in the roles and make the Tea Party the villains. Like, you know, comprised of various villains, representations and references to the original story, but they're all filled in by villains that we know. I doubt it. Though her keypad code, which they made sure we saw multiple times, was also 6420, which, on a keypad, spells out mice. But it also equally spells out nice, and both seem wrong for Harriet. Also why you would have the hair fill the uh, role of the Dormouse, dunno. It also had me thinking, you know, it's a shame Tyrion isn't here to fill the role of the Cheshire Cat. Yeah, he's a scorpion, but that, that grin, man. Unless Blake gets crazy happy when she sees Yang, goes all insane. She can somewhat vanish with her shadow clones, so I guess she's the Cheshire Cat. Confirmed. The Dormouse equally doesn't really have an equivalent, unfortunately. We don't really have tons of sleepy people. It's not super solid, hence why I'm not, you know, making it its own video, I'm sort of tacking it into the end of this theory. If it wasn't obvious these ideas aren't rounded and finished, it's just what I'm thinking about. I was originally thinking Oscar was the right rabbit because time, but he's not coming. Though thought. White. Time. Wise. Time dilation finally making a return, boys. Woo! Yes! Nah. But it did stand out to me that the Tea Party is a four-person group, at least, which Ruby is obviously fond of. So if we could find four villains or four people to fill the roles, it could be fun. Because then, obviously, you work with the Tea Party to take down the evil queen. So people like Cinder and Neo being dropped into Wonderland along with our heroes that they just tried to kill, and realizing they need to work together, or none of them make it out, is exactly the kind of spice that would be good to add into the mix to make this mini travel arc more exciting. As far as the innocent, put-upon girl who lived in high society, I guess that makes Penny the perfect candidate? She's the new innocent girl, literally. She's brand new. She's spent time in Atlas, so that's like, you know, the rich high society. And I know we want to immediately say it's Ruby because she's like the protagonist, but I think Penny fits better. Also, that means that, again, travel arc, learning arc, she can learn to use her powers more. As well as coming to terms with, you know, being a real meat person now. And she can do the Alice thing of challenging the morality of the place with her very pure ideals. I will say though, and it's a complete mixing of stories and influences, but I think Ruby will be the one to get them home though. I know it's not Alice in Wonderland at all, but instead it's back to Oz. Like I said, in Alice in Wonderland there isn't really a good way home, like a consistent way they travel home, but there is in Oz. What is it that gets Dorothy home? Ruby slippers. Ruby slippers. We have this parallel idea between Alice in Wonderland and The Wizard of Oz that they're both like dream realms, that these fantasy places that people get sent to, but they wake up from as if they're dreams. So if Penny can be Alice, then Ruby can be the literal Ruby slippers and take them home like Dorothy. It'd also give her the sort of win at the end of the volume. As you can tell, these ideas are half-baked. We're far from solid with this outline. Without the volume's finale as well, it's we're even further away. But I thought I'd put where my head is at for the moment. I do really think the stuff with dropping the staff makes sense. Though of course, if it is a magic realm between realms with gods and spirits, or maybe the dead, who knows? There could obviously be other answers. But the idea of needing a way home is solid motivation, and while seeking out a magic being for help sounds reasonable, it's also pretty convenient that it works so that we have this staff that we know can do this. Plus it kind of just lines up with the Ruby story in general, that in the end they always end up just traveling from relic to relic anyway, so why change it, right? Traveling to a way out is exactly the same, except that we already know what the relics are. Also you can get things like a fun, sort of awkward send-off at the end, where having worked with Cinder or Neo, these former enemies, they seem to have been friends, but now they're standing around near the staff and have to trust that the other will take them too. And who gets it on the other side? Will this alliance last? Is it, you know, forever or is it completely off once we're back in the other land? Or do we act like it's back when we're in the other land but slowly they come round to realizing they are friends now? Well, you know, whatever. If you get into more adaptations, like perhaps the Disney one, we also have stuff like Time, the character of Time, who traps them in like perpetual tea time. You could do a whole thing with this where like Wonderland time is essentially time stopped for everywhere else, like they're acting within moments in the real world. Could be cool, I guess, but I don't think it'll happen because it'd be weird to not go back to the source with all these stories, like meaning the novels, where that's sort of less of a thing. And also I really think it's going to cut back and forth to break up the Wonderland stuff, to keep Wonderland feeling weird and also so you don't get sick of it. I do highly, highly think though there will be a monster to beat in Neverland. A great beast to slay. Perhaps it's the mini-boss before they get to the staff. Because the Jabberwock. Seriously, if you're diving into Neverland, you have a golden opportunity with the Jabberwocky to make a monster to fight. I've said before, if they traveled in time, there's a cool idea like Ruby having to kill her mum, Summer, as a grim monster, and that's her Jabberwocky. Even if it's not a literal trip in time, you could still do it where 
the Jabberwocky is her mum as a Grimm, but it's summoned from her head, you know, the idea she had? So, it's a bit like Luke fighting Vader in the cave, you know? It's a creation of your own head, it means things to you, you know? You're fighting yourself, and you're fighting your own ideas, and your dark side, and... It's, yeah, it's that same idea, and Summer is that to her. Oh my god, these things happened to my mom, she got turned into a hound. So, the great beast of Neverland, the Jabberwocky, is Summer to her, and they have to beat that. You know, you could do things like that, where things in the in Neverland are creations from your mind, you know? Pulling from magic and thoughts, and you influence the world around you. That could be really cool to play with, like, conceptually, getting weird again. And very dreamlike. There's the Vorpal Sword as well, which is what kills the Jabberwocky. Uh, I did have the idea that it could be the Sword of Destruction, if you're back in time, it's out of its vault, uh, before we return, so we get a sneak peek of what we're fighting for in the next arc, because we know what it can do. You know, getting a sneak peek at the true powers of destruction. But I don't actually think we're going through time, so probably not. But if you're doing the Jabberwocky, you're also doing the Vorpal Sword, you kinda gotta. And this is a story about groups of warriors who slay monsters, so you have a great weapon for slaying, and a monster. But also, I'm gonna point this out, the Jabberwock poem is intentionally nonsense, but take note of its description. The Jabberwock with eyes of flame. That's word for word the text. So, the other option is it's a maiden, is the Jabberwock. The big bad. So, Cinder could fit the bill, or something awful happens to Penny. There's no Vorpal Sword in this analogy though. But it's also important to point out that the Jabberwock dies having its head removed. Something with flaming eyes that has its head removed by a great sword. So, maybe it's time for Jean to find the kill Cinder with his Vorpal Sword. Off with their heads indeed. Anyway, this isn't really a whole Staff of Creation video, more a veiled excuse for me to get some of my Wonderland ideas out there, and also address the dropping of the staff into the void thing I keep seeing popping up. I hope this was interesting, maybe it sparked some more ideas for you. If you have any more ideas, please expand and let me know in the comments, it'd be great to hear. I'm not one of those people that just wants to keep all my thoughts to myself and hide it away until they're all done so I can aha you, no. I'm here to share my thoughts, or, you know, whatever's on my mind, and even if they're unfinished. There's no reason we can't revisit these with more detail once we have more to go off of, but for now, this is what we have. Perhaps more conclusions will become clear as we get the finale, but this is what we've got. Until next time, a question. What do Yang and the Staff of Creation have in common? Not just that they're falling into Wonderland, but one way or the other, they're going to need to stick the landing. Anyway, my name is Rigo, hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope I did alright.